Our uh, second speaker this afternoon will uh, illustrate the Faculty Scholar Program. The background thinking of this was that you recruit a brilliant young faculty member, they get their startup package from their chairman and the dean, but then there comes this sort of intermediate period between being an early career to a fully established career and the idea of these uh, term limited uh, faculty scholar awards was to bridge uh, the individual through that critical time period. And uh, so we have the honor of having uh, Manpreet Singh. She's an associate uh, a professor of psychiatry. And uh, she did her training or medical school in Michigan State and then went to Cincinnati Children's for a psychiatric uh, training and is going to talk to us today about mood disorders. So Manpreet. Thank you, Dr. Brodovich, both for your inspirational leadership and for giving me the opportunity to talk today about 10 years of uh, research and science that I've been doing. I've, I feel like I've grown with the Institute, and uh, I'm very pleased to share some of the work that I've been working on um, over the past decade with you today. And I also appreciate following Dr. Dahl, um, who uh, had uh, nicely and efficiently explained the physiology underlying imaging so that I can work, um, I can focus on other things. I hope you'll consider speed dating with him this afternoon, because I think I would if I wasn't dating you. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about what we face today. This is child psychiatry today. My kid says he is depressed. I already took his phone away. Is there anything else I can do to get him out of this phase? So this sort of illustrates uh, the kind of conundrum that we're facing in our field. We want to use technology to our advantage. Should we use social media to decrease the, um, the vulnerability towards certain behaviors, uh, such as vaping or, or, or even just recurrent social media use? But then um, one, of the, one of the main areas of discovery in, in behavioral health and the science of behavioral health and change has to do with leveraging digital phenotyping and digital uh, resources. So, Let's talk about this in the context of depression. It's the leading cause of global health burden. Stigma and limited access to care have motivated many of us to think about the science of behavior change from multiple perspectives to create the greatest impact. I'm not concerned that my career or my, my, my profession is on the line or is going to be replaced by digital therapeutics or other um, modalities. We still need careful clinical uh, um, uh, diagnostic assessments uh, to really understand the most uh, complex phenotypes that exist in medicine, but we face some contemporary challenges. Pediatric antidepressant trials have shown a strong placebo effect, and sometimes the medications we use to treat depression trigger elevated mood states like euphoria or explosive irritability, so we find ourselves chasing our tails. And clinicians today struggle also to distinguish symptoms from, of a primary mood disorder from side effects that are used to treat those mood disorders. When first, second, and third line treatments fail, we don't have anything good for anything bad. There are also challenges discerning typical development. What's What's a usual typical developmental tra uh, challenge or transition, particularly in puberty, from, from a maladaptive behavior or problematic behavior that requires intervention? And most individuals with depression wait on average 10 years or more before getting an accurate diagnosis. So we need three key breakthroughs to prevent depression from lasting a lifetime. These are better treatments for people living with depression that predict and track outcomes. We need preemptive interventions for those at risk or in pre-symptomatic stages. And we need biomarkers for early detection. I think of this as my roadmap in translational psychiatry. And I think about possibly resilience as and building on the science of resilience as a potentially intriguing solution to the problem of depression. So what's resilience and why is it the answer to preventing lifelong depression? 
Well, we know that it's a complex and dynamic process. And we define it typically as the ability to adapt successfully to adversity, stressful life events, significant threat or trauma. And it tends to be on a continuum and can be cultivated with a potential for change across the lifespan. It's not a fixed state. You can push levels to increase resilience and lower risk or susceptibility. It's fluid. There are a number of areas that people have talked about that qualify resilience. What makes you resilient? Is it keeping a positive attitude? Is it reframing your stressful thoughts? Do you develop a moral compass? Find a resilient role model. We talked a lot about mentorship and um, shepherding the next generation of scientists in our field. Face your fears, develop active coping skills, establish and nurture a supportive social network. Prioritize physical well-being. We know that there's a tremendous science supporting the value of exercise. Should we train our brain? And how do we do that? And do we play to our strengths? as ways of engaging in resilience. Anthony Biglin recently wrote a book called The Nurture Effect, How the Science of Human Behavior Can Improve Our Lives and Our World. It's a very interesting book because it, what it tells us is that we actually know a lot. Behavioral neuroscience has taught us a lot about what we can do to improve society and shore up resilience, not just in an individual level, but worldwide. He says that we should promote and reinforce pro-social behaviors. Show interest, support, appreciation, and love for what people do to contribute to the well-being of others. Minimize socially and biologically toxic conditions. It's important that we find ways to minimize coercion, which is the root cause of human conflict. Monitor and set limits on influences and opportunities to engage in problem behaviors. Be present, supervise, and set limits to that social media access while also gradually allowing management of a child's own free time in a safe, fun, and productive way. It's also important to promote mindful, flexible, and pragmatic pursuit of pro-social values, accepting others' emotions and thoughts. This, I believe, are intriguing, in my view, central key uh, areas of um, promotion of resilience. And we also understand that there's some cross-species evidence for this. In a recent Nature Neuroscience paper, colleagues in Mount Sinai published a gene, co gene co-expression analysis of RNA-seq data from brains of mice resilient to social defeat stress to identify a gene network that is unique to resilience. ZFP189, which encodes a previously unstudied zinc finger protein, is the highest ranked key driver gene in the network. And overexpression of ZFP189 in the prefrontal cortex neurons preferentially activates this network and promotes behavioral resilience in these mice. So we have an idea of what makes people resilient, but we don't have a lot of science to support why people are resilient. So who will be resilient? Who will develop depression? We all have our good days and our bad days. My children illustrate this well. Because family history is the most reliable risk factor for developing depression, our team has used it as a model system to understand the impact of parental mood disorders on their offspring. Our brains evolve from the bottom up, where limbic and striatal regions of the brain develop first. And this is evolutionarily advantageous for survival so that infants and children can get immediate support for caregiving. What happens when the caregiver has depression? Healthy children of parents with bipolar disorder uh, report chaotic family environments. And even when they themselves weren't symptomatic, the brains of these healthy youth showed that the higher the family chaos environmentally, the more disconnected their brain networks. 
This was not true for youth who didn't have a parent with mood or other psychiatric disorders. And this observation led us to wonder, what else could we learn from the brain that could clue us in about the vulnerabilities towards developing depression? So we set out to do a risk and resilience study using multimodal assessments. We did brain MRI scans in kids, offspring of parents with bipolar disorder and offspring of parents who don't have any psychiatric illnesses. We did comprehensive clinical and biological assessments. We did diurnal cortisol, um, multimodal imaging, um, structured clinical interviews. The Faculty Scholar Award enabled me to add a group of offspring of parents with depression so I could take a look at differential risk factors based on subtypes of depression, whether it was unipolar or bipolar increase the sample size and follow these kids starting from a stage of health and prospectively evaluate them over a three to five year period. And what it turned out to be the case, now we've now had a chance to look at these kids up to now seven years. And on average, between three to five years, what we've seen is that about a third of them have developed a mood disorder of some sort, but two thirds of them still remain resilient. Now, we've got to continue to follow these kids, and um, hopefully we'll learn more as time goes on, and perhaps once they've reached a critical sensitive window beyond which the vulnerability reduce, re decreases significantly, we may be safe to say that these kids are out of the woods. However, and, and the rates of conversion are typical of what we see in the literature, so that wasn't surprising. One of the things that we did learn when we compared kids of parents uh, at risk for mood disorders to kids who already developed depression is that the brain actually provided us with clues about stages of depression, whether someone was at risk for depression or already developed symptoms. In other words, the brain showed different, differential levels of connectivity depending on whether the child was classified as being at risk or already symptomatic. Our postdoctoral fellows in our team, uh, Dr. Adina Fisher, um, has recently shown that there's actually also clues in the brain that differentiate unipolar and bipolar risk phenotypes. And those can be distinguished even when the brain is at rest. And this critical difference actually has a significant treatment implication because when youth with bipolar disorder present with depression and are inadvertently given an antidepressant that can trigger mania, this becomes a conundrum for a lot of clinicians who are seeing these kids for the first time and don't know what the trajectory of their symptoms are going to be. And so having some objective measure in the brain that can help us distinguish these phenotypes even before these symptoms set in can be critically important for treatment planning. Dr. Fisher also looked, did some predictive modeling and was able to show that connectivity at baseline in youth who are resilient also differentiated kids who developed symptoms at follow-up. And so you could see that limbic and striatal to prefrontal connectivities predicted kids who were resilient versus those who had converted into symptoms. My graduate student in neuroscience, Akuna Marco, has also looked at the, the signatures while kids are processing emotions. Again, healthy youth at risk for mood disorders compared to healthy controls and found differential activations um, in response to happy versus calm faces in a central area of the brain important for reward processing, the putamen, and a critical region that ends up having developmental, um, undergoes developmental changes through adolescence. She has also shown, similar to Dr. Fisher, that, this, that these um, uh, phenotypes in the brain can actually delineate unipolar and bipolar risk during emotion processing and also with connectivity. And the other interesting finding is that she found that parietal precuneous connectivity predicted resilience three years after, and these uh, connectivity estimates tracked with in improved prosocial behavior. So stronger connectivity predicted uh, higher prosocial behaviors uh, on follow-up in the kids who were resilient. So 
if we have some sense of what the brain can potentially show us, can we potentially also then cultivate pro-social behaviors to change the brain and then change the outcome in high-risk youth who develop symptoms? So if kids who are already symptomatic, can we use early intervention strategies to shore up their pro-social behaviors to improve their mood outcomes? How do we cultivate pro-social behaviors? Well, when a kid comes to my office, when a kid comes to a pediatrician's office, when a kid comes to an allied mental health professional's office, the first thing we do is we educate them about the symptoms. We talk to them about what does depression look like. We talk about the um, strategies to self-monitor. Perhaps it's using an app, a mood app, or it's per perhaps it's developing a language, especially since kids don't talk about melancholia. <laughs> They, talked about, they talk about somatic complaints. They talk about their tummy hurting and they not wanting to go to school. And how does that translate to how they're feeling inside? So those, that education is a very important first step. But it is a very singular individual level training process. It's therapeutically at the level of the individual. How can we cultivate pro-social behaviors? If you train on pro-social behaviors, the things that you're doing isn't just educating a kid about symptoms. You're talking to them about how to effectively communicate with others. When they have parents who are struggling to parent them effectively because of depressive symptoms, they might not know how to express feelings, uh, communicate, advocate for themselves, uh, express positive feelings towards uh, family members, or even talk about things that bug them about their parents or their family members. This creates a lot of conflict. And so what families do when they come for therapy, particularly family-based therapy, is they almost need to retrain themselves on how to interact with one another. I have gone through the effort of even, if you would imagine, taking out my prescription pad and writing on my prescription pad, go and see a movie together. Because families, after interacting with each other in such a negative way for so long, forget how to interact with each other in a positive way. So communication skills, problem solving. This is something that everyone wants to come and circumvent. They want the magic bullet. Doc, can you just fix all my problems? We're not here to fix people's problems. We need to empower them to engage in, uh, in their own problem solving. And so we systematically help patients and families go through problem solving skills training where they interact with one another. It's by definition pro-social. And family-focused therapy is what we call it. So what does family-focused therapy do? If you compare it to just enhanced care where all you're doing is that psychoeducation, it turns out that family-focused therapy, that pro-social skills training, delays depression recurrence by 35 more weeks than just psychoeducation alone. Can you imagine two-thirds of your year being depression symptom-free just by providing training in pro-social skills? Differences in brain connectivity are also reflected. And what we wanted to do is look to see if there were any effects on the brain by doing family-focused therapy. First, when we did an in independent components analysis and compared kids at risk for mood disorders to healthy controls, we found that their networks were oriented differently. The anterior de default mode network, super important for self-referential thinking and um, knowing one's place in, um, in the world. Uh, had increased connectivity in youth at risk for uh, mood disorders compared to controls to the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, an area that we've seen time and time again regulate emotions. And then when we looked prospectively pre to post treatment, the kids that got FFT showed increased connectivity in these areas compared to the kids who didn't get that pro-social skills training. And if you compared them again to kids uh, at health, uh, the healthy controls at baseline, it was almost as if it was an increased uh, connectivity that was compensatory um, and uh, also correlated with improved symptoms. So it's clear that you can, if you change the brain, you can train the brain and you can change the outcome. 
So our Pediatric Emotion and Resilience Lab at Stanford has been engaged in all aspects of trying to leverage the science of resilience to prevent depression from lasting a lifetime. And over the course of the development, we're trying to design new studies that use interdisciplinary collaborations, develop cross-species models of adaptation to stress, refining methods to accurately measure peripheral-derived exosomes, central insulin and peripheral insulin resistance, resolve the complex relations between peripheral and central um, uh, uh, physiological factors, and look at the effects of transcranial magnetic stimulation and other potential strategies. Our vision is really to create impactful roadmaps that move from transactional to transformative. And when we do this, we can actually also make an impact, even greater impact, because a mother's depression is associated with lower than average birth weight and preterm deliveries, as well as problems in children, um, such as impaired cognitive functioning and development. So we believe that we got to start this at the beginning of conception to make the most impact possible. I want to. Um, Acknowledge our village, all the patients, research participants, and families who inspire our work, to Akiko Yamazaki and Jerry Yang for endowing my faculty scholar award, and to MCHRI for supporting my academic resilience, really, um, at Stanford. And I just want to also end poetically, perhaps, um, closing the day after Dr. Bianchi's wonderful opening um, of today's events. I want to acknowledge my sister, with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease who taught me the value of conveying hope, particularly in children at risk for or living with chronic illnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. I think we have time for one very quick question. Hey, Dr. Singh, thank you for a very powerful speech. Um, I was wondering if there are any effective screening programs for prenatal screening of postnatal depression risks and early intervention before it actually becomes dangerous to the mother. Right. No, there are a number of screening questionnaires that are available widely in primary care settings. The PHQ-9 is used widely in pediatrics, um, but a number of scales can be used just as gateway uh, screeners um, and are validated globally um, to screen for depression. In fact, most OBGYN clinics now include depression screening as part of, um, part of their process. Um, we need to do the, a better job of um, destigmatizing this issue globally and allowing people to have conversations about the, the physiological effects of hormonal shifts around pregnancy, um, but also to track and follow patients, um, mothers, um, into the fourth um, trimester uh, of pregnancy. And, um, and so I agree that it's actually helpful for us to look preemptively before uh, uh, pregnancy begins and, and, and follow uh, mothers through 